Thank you. Cool, yes. Hi, I'm Jack. I'm a senior Android developer at Trainline. Today I'm going to be talking about architectures and like, do they even matter? Um, so yeah, what am I going to be talking about? First we're going to talk about like, what actually is architecture and why do you need one? We're going, to talk, we're going to hold off on the code for like two minutes. Then we're going to talk about presentation patterns, all the popular ones. Then we're going to ask like, is this the future? Like, do we just do this forever? So then we'll talk about molecule and reusable components in Compose. And finally, which is the best? And you'll, <laughs> you'll notice there's a question mark, because maybe that's a spoiler that the answer is not definitive. Um, but yeah. So this was a quote I found from Danny Thorpe, which I think is kind of cool. But programming without an overall architecture or design in mind is like exploring a cave with only a flashlight. You don't know where you've been, you don't know where you're going, and you don't know quite where you are. So yeah. What, what is architecture? I googled it. Uh, You'll find that most of the time when you Google what is architecture, you will not find anything about software. Uh, it will mostly be about buildings. Uh, so these were the definitions I found. The art or practice of constructing buildings and the complex and carefully designed structure of something. I thought this was kind of interesting because I love architecture, so the idea of architecture being art, I like that, yeah. And also complex or carefully designed structure. I thought complexity was invented by software engineers, so I was a little surprised to see that real architects who make buildings have the same issue. Um, so yeah, maybe it's a chicken egg problem, like do architectures make things complex or do you need an architecture when things become complex? Who knows? Um, yeah, so what is software architecture? Software architecture, according to Martin Fowler, who wrote a great book called Refactoring, you should read it. Um, but he wrote a blog about architecture, the shared understanding of expert developers. And I think this is actually like quite important because when you're at work and you're talking to other people about code, you don't want to like explain the basics. Like you want to have some level of like, we all agree on these things, let's discuss these things. So having shared understanding with the rest of your team is quite important. Uh, architecture is about the important stuff. Uh, this was another idea that I liked because I mentioned what is the best architecture, right? The answer is it depends. Most questions in engineering, the answer is it depends. I can't tell you what's the best architecture for you because I don't know your app and I don't know your code. And without the context, it's really hard to give any answers. So your architecture should be built around the problems that your app faces and not problems that other people have that don't affect you at all. But yeah, and that kind of comes to this. So anyone who knows me will have heard of this book. I've been mentioning it a lot lately. Uh, Tanya O'Reilly, The Staff Engineer's Path. Good decisions need context. Experienced engineers know the answer to most technology choices is it depends. Knowing the pros and cons is not enough. You need to know the details. So yeah, what can we say is important about architecture? What do we actually want from our architecture? Uh, simplicity and abstraction of complexity. We don't want to open our code and be like, the fuck is this? Equally, we want consistent design of features. Like, if I'm in team A working on feature A, and some developer in team B, feature B, comes and asks me for help, Ideally, I just open the root view of their feature and I can find pretty much anything I want because I know where it's supposed to be. Um, it's not always the case, obviously. Testability and observability. So these are really important ideas. You d I've definitely seen a lot of architectures where testing and observability is not a consideration at all. But you should probably consider how to make these things better when you're deciding what architecture to use. Correctness and reducing bugs. You want to write code that is less likely to be buggy. You want, this one I put industry alignment slash ease of onboarding. I, I was reading a Reddit post where all good information is found. And someone said, uh, if you use MVVM, a developer will join your team and in two days they'll commit. If you use MVI, a developer will join your team and in two months they'll commit. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but it kind of does make a little bit of sense. Yeah. What can we say we don't want? We don't want Frankenstein, we don't want spaghetti, and we don't want to bow down to the Android activity and sell our souls to them, because that would not be good. So I mentioned context and how context is important. I thought I'd give you a bit of context about Trainline. So I opened our project this morning. We have, I stopped counting after a while, but I did, I just searched for usages of activity and there was over 100. Uh, they have over 100 modules, have 35 developers, all of them are committing to one repository that has 25,000 commits. 
And also, all the commits are just merges, so that doesn't count the commits on the feature branch. Uh, the first commit was in 2014, and we have 12 teams right now working on the app. Yeah. I'm going to skip past that. It's not, it's not important. <laughs> yeah. Presentation patterns. This is how I imagine I look right now, or at least what I told my mum it was going to look like. Uh, but yeah. So all good talks come with an app. So naturally, I made an app for this talk. I'm going to show it you quickly. It's pretty straightforward. Like You just open it. It loads some products. There's a screen to add the product to your basket, and then the product is going to come. But I'm talking too fast, so I'll let it load and do its thing. But yeah, you can see how great I am at UI design. Um, <coughs> but we're going to open it. We're going to see this. And then hopefully, once we add it to the basket, we're going to see the basket. And we're going to add something else. I like perfume. And then we'll go to the next screen. And we see the basket here as well. So cool. So let's start with MVP. Uh, some people might be thinking, like, why are we talking about MVP? It's like 2024, isn't it? Um, so can I get a quick show of hands? Who works on a project that has no MVP features? OK. Who works on a project that does have MVP? Who works on a project that has a lot of MVP? <laughs> OK. Yeah. So what is MVP? So I think we all know, but like in MVP, the presenter has a reference to the view, and everything comes through a method. You call a method, you do something. There's a real emphasis on contracts and having a really dumb view, and the tests are very explicit. So you can see some code. You're probably going to have a contract like this. It's like show loading, show error, show error message, set product models, show list. Like it's very, very explicit. You can imagine that if you wrote a unit test for this method, it would pretty much just be like verify view dot this, verify view dot this. Like it becomes like your test essentially defines your behavior. The problem is it ends up looking like this real fast. Like sooner or later, you're calling methods all over the place. You have like nested presenters. You're calling back to the main view. And anyone trying to figure out what's happening is going to have a very bad day. So eventually, and the other thing is Google stopped supporting it. So Google, in like 2017, I think, became very big on MVVM. Later, they've changed their definition to just reactive observability because they want to include MVI. Um, but yeah, like, if you've ever tried using MVP and Compose together, like, you just end up writing bootleg MVVM. And at that point, like, yeah, there's not a lot of support for this anymore. So here we are. A little meme for the Star Wars fans like me. MVM, MVVM. Hey, have you watched this? So. The only difference, really, is the observable state pattern. Uh, I put that multiple states are possible. You could easily do MVVM with one state, but we're going to talk about MVI in a minute. So I put multiple states are possible in MVVM. Uh, there's a single stream of side effects, and the view does not know about the presenter. It's completely decoupled, and Google is supporting it. So the classic view model. One of the things I really want to talk about in this talk is that an architecture is about Principles and ideas. Architectures have principles, like MVVM. The principles are ob observable state, stream of side effects, view doesn't know about the presenter. There's also implementation details, right? Like, you can have one state, you can have many states, you can use state flows, you can use shared flows, you can use channel. If you really want to, you can use live data. Like, it's all MVVM, it's just implementation details. So, let's talk about, oh, yeah. You can do one state, you can do two states. Like, it's MVVM. Let's go back to our app. So the first feature of our app is going to be to load the data. So how do we actually build this, right? We have a loading view, and we have our products. So we're going to have our state and our effects. Uh, our states look like this. We just have loading, error, and the product list when it's loaded. So to get from here to here, we basically are going to do this in our init. We're going to call our use case to get all the products. We're going to reduce the state. There's only one possible state in this app when the data is good, because I didn't worry too much about other states. And if there's an error, we're going to catch it and show the error state. And we do some mapping in the middle. Um, what about navigation, right? Navigation, also pretty easy. We just add a method. We access our state to get the ID, and then we release an effect. So what's, what could possibly go wrong here, right? Like, why don't we just write code like this for the rest of time, and there's never going to be any architectural issues, right? Um, 
So let's just look at this code again. We already have like a lot of responsibilities here. So we're switching the scope to make sure we don't we handle the lifecycle and we don't leak anything. We're going to load the data and receive a result. Then we're going to reduce a new state, which looks really simple here. But if you can imagine that, like, based on the data, there could be one of three states. Uh, quickly, this logic can actually get quite complicated. Then we're mapping our UI model, and we're handling the errors. So I put six comments. I hope I counted that right. For six responsibilities on one tiny method. The other thing is, as we add more behavior, like the scaling just goes badly. Like, so we want to add this basket view. We have to add a whole use case and a mapper just to handle the basket, plus another state. You don't have to do this, but I'm doing it in this app to show it. We do another like coroutines manipulation slash accessing a flow in our init. And then we add another method to handle the continue button. So just to add this like one tiny little view at the bottom of our screen, we've basically doubled the size of the view model. Which you might think like, what's the problem here, right? Like how bad can it really get? How complicated is your app, right? Well, I went too fast. You could do this with one state. But now you're going to have to handle different scenarios. Like, what if the basket loads and then the products have an error? How do you handle that? When there are two states, you can kind of think about them separately. But with one state, you have to do a lot of data class mapping, and it becomes a real problem. It.copy is going to be everywhere. This is what single state looks like, and you can see the code. But yeah. So you might think to yourself, this code is not so bad, right? Like, why don't we just write code like this? How complicated could our screen really be? Well, here's the most complicated screen in the Chainline app. This is our payment screen. Uh, you can see it looks like this in the UK. It looks completely different in other countries. We have a bunch of toggles that you can click to reveal more data. You can change all of your basket and reload the whole screen. If you've ever, you don't want to look at the code for this screen, trust me. Like, <laughs> it's, it's a situation. It's, we're working on it. We're working on it. So here comes MVI, right, to answer all of our problems. So how does it do that? The main difference with MVI is really three things. So the first thing is, I said in MVVM you can have more than one state. In MVI, no, 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 no. There's only one state in MVI. That's the end. Zero, zero room for maneuver on that. The second thing is, we also only have one single stream of inputs. So Previously, where we were doing like on continue button clicked, on back pressed in the view model, now we're just going to have one method, and that's the only method the view can ever call, and it's going to send absolutely everything to that method. And that might sound bad, but with sealed classes, it kind of makes sense. The second thing, and this is, I talked about principles and ideas. I've seen people do MVI without the reducer, but in my head, you should probably do the reducer. So yeah, in MVI, the idea is that we don't deal with state reduction and actually handling the results at the same time. We do this separately. And I'll show you what that actually means in a minute, because it sounds very hand wavy. So we have a reducer that's going to look like this, which is going to take the current state and the result from the view model, and it's going to map the new state. Our view model is going to declare that it's inheriting from MVI view model, which I, I took the code out of the slides because it's a really complicated class. but you can just trust that the, view, the base view model is putting everything together under the hood. Uh, we have this one method, handle intent, and we have a sealed interface, product list intent. And that's really the contract of our view model. So I'm going to show diagrams before I show the code. So if we want to load the data in MVI, the screen is going to send the initial content intent to the view model. The view model is going to try to get the products. The product's going to come back. The view model is going to send the products loaded result to the reducer along with the current state, which you can see in the top left. And it's going to receive back the new state and change the current state. So how does this look in the code? We have this method handle intent. We have we receive loading or error. Does that make sense? Oh, we check if the current state is loading or error. We say that I'm going to come back to this. Loading. So when we get the initial intent from loading, we emit the products loaded after we've called the get all products method. You'll see that we have some illegal state exceptions here. So one of the really important things about MVI is this idea of correctness and completeness. So this behavior actually existed in the MVVM version. You just didn't see it. It wasn't as explicit. And we didn't throw an error. 
But here at the start, we do state.value as product list, and then basically, if it's not product list, we do nothing. So like, does it make any sense, right? Like, can you click a product when the products are still loading? Of course not. So we just throw in a legal state exception and say that can never happen. Uh, the idea of MVI is this might seem scary, but we're really like narrowing down the code paths to the, only the code paths we can actually see in production. So if we see the crash in production on Crashlytics, like something went really badly wrong in our QA, because we should have been checking whether that was possible. Similarly, in the reducer, so we're going to check what the current state is, and then we're going to reduce the state with the, load, with the result. So for the loading, if the intent is products loaded, that's fine. And if the intent is error, that's fine. But as you can see, when we're in the state of error or in the state of product list, there actually isn't any intents we can receive. So we just throw errors from here. And you can see how, so, so to navigate, it's even easier. We don't have to do any communication with the reducer. It's exactly the same as the MVVM, at least in my implementation. So yeah, why don't we just do MVI forever, right? Like, what's, what's the problem with MVI? That's kind of where I'm going, right? So we, let's, well, let's first talk about how to add the basket in MVI. It's actually not that complicated. We just add another state. I mentioned we have to handle when the basket comes first. So you can see, in MVI, when we send the initial intent with the basket, now we have to do two things on initialization. We have to get the products, and we have to get the basket. And there's basically two universes. In universe A on the left, it's always sunny. There's always rainbows. We all work on a project where there's no product managers, and we never get blocked by anything. And it's just a wonderful world, right? Like the pro in, in universe A, the products come back first. So the products come back first. We do the exact same thing. We send the product loaded result. We get the new state. Then our basket comes. We send the basket changed result and our state works. Universe B, that's where we live. That's the real world. Uh, in universe B, the basket comes back first. So when the basket comes back first, we still send the basket changed, but we receive this new state, basket loaded. And that might seem kind of weird, because when the state changes from loading to basket loaded, the UI will not change. Like, that, this view will just not react at all. We're just having this extra state for the view model, essentially, so that it can still get to the basket. And actually, like, to some people, this might be weird, but I think it makes sense, because the view model is not meant to know about the view, right? So why does the view model care that the view isn't going to change between loading and loading basket? Like, maybe it will. Maybe someday someone will change the requirement and will make it look different. But the idea here is that we're really separating our view model from our view, because the state is becoming about the view model. Like, the view model doesn't care about anybody else. It's just matters about how to get to the state it needs to be in. So adding the basket, you can again see, right? Like I mentioned in MVI, there's one stream of intents. So we don't have to add new methods, right? We just add this extra state in our handle intents. In the initial intent handling, we merge this extra flow in and handle the result. And then we add this extra intent to click the continue button and the code really doesn't grow all that much. So that was MVVM compared to in MVI. This is all the changes. So yeah, there's some stuff in the reducer, but the reducer is really basic. So I cut that bit out. One of the other things I really like is the product list content. So every view is going to look like this. You're going to have a state, and you're going to have a method, and it will never grow, because you don't need anything else as long as you're doing MVI. So that's it, right? Don't we just do flows and coroutines and MVI or MVVM forever? Like, why would you ever think about doing something else? Let's just, why does Google still have engineers to work on anything, right? So let, we haven't really thought about this screen yet. So this screen is like really basic. The UI looks horrible, I know. Uh, but the key thing about this screen is you'll see the basket is there. And that's the exact same composable that was on the previous screen. So like, what are we going to do? Just copy and paste all the code to handle the basket into our other view model. Like, that doesn't sound very fun. So, and I mean, obviously, you could make it nicer than this, right? Like, extract the mapper, like, make some class to do this for you. But it, I don't like it. I don't like it. I'm just going to be honest. It kind of looks like this. So 
we could just use a basket view model, right? Like, why don't you just have a view model for the list and a view model for the basket? Well, no, like, you can in this case, but Google is quite explicit in their documentation that view models should be for the screen. And as much as I don't love Google and their guidance on a lot of things, like, it's probably best not to actively do things, something they tell you not to do in case they eventually change the API so that you literally can't do that anymore. Uh, so, introduce molecule. Most of you will know, whenever we have a problem in Android, we look to old Jake Wharton's Twitter, and we see if he's released a new library. It turns out he has. It turns out. He's thought about this problem, too. So I took these examples straight from the readme. The idea of Molecule is basically to extract the presentation logic into a reusable component, and it uses Compose to do this. So you can see you would write this Composable, which returns a model, and it passes flows in, it collects the flows of state, and then it handles the manipulation of the flows. Then this code on the right, this would be in our view model. So here we just access the flows, we launch this molecule thing, and it basically produces this state flow for us that executes every time something <coughs> on the flows change. So let's look at that on our screen, right? The basket presenter is pretty simple. Like, it looks like this. There's two real approaches you can use here, right? Like, one is you can take the code we've already shown, your existing MVVM code, and you can just only use Molecule for the bit that you need it for, right, the basket. That would look kind of like this. This is essentially the same MVVM view model I showed you before, but the basket code is all just in this, like, basket presenter here at the top. Or you can also try the Molecule view model. Which, when I, I'm going to be honest, I saw this in the sample that is in the molecule library. There's a sample directory. And I opened it up and I saw this class and I was like, yeah, no, <laughs> I'm not using that. And then I wrote it and I was like, you know what? Like, it kind of does make sense. Like, the idea here is essentially we have this abstract fund models, which is a composable. And then we have a state flow models at the top. And essentially, in our view model, we're only going to implement that one method models. And our entire view model is going to be here. That's it. One method for the whole view model. Now, it might look a little bit scary. And I'm going to be honest and say there was cleaner examples. But I had, my laptop, I had a whole incident with my laptop to ask me at the pub. Uh, so I lost a good example. But I still think this is great, right? Because like, now, all we have to do is pretty much the exact same thing on the postage. And all of this basket behavior comes for free. So a recap. I'm talking very fast, so I'm going to recap. MVVM. What do I like about MVVM? It's really simple. Like, you can get going in like 20 minutes. It's flexible and dynamic. You don't really have to think too hard when you write MVVM. It just, you just do what makes sense, right? And it's universal and easy to get up to speed. Like I said, if someone joins your company, they've definitely done MVVM before. What I don't like is the growth of the view model. Uh, the problem with the growth of the view model, really, is not actually the growth of the view model. It's that eventually some developer is going to come to your view model. They're going to open it, see a thousand line view model. And the analogy I use is like, if you're walking past a warehouse, right, and the warehouse is brand new and someone just built it, you're probably not going to throw a brick through the window. But like, if you walk past an abandoned warehouse where every single window is smashed except for one, no one's going to arrest you if you just pick up another brick and throw it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so. That's sort of how developers start to view your view model. You, they see crappy code and they think, no one's going to complain if I write crappy code. And so you just end up with more and more and more crappy code. Uh, MVI, what I like is, I don't know if I just really came across in the code, but like, it's just so consistent. Like, you, there's only one way to write the code. Like, if you don't do it the way you're supposed to, you're going to run into some problems. You're going to have to ask someone to help, and they're going to be like, the reason it's not working is because you're doing the wrong thing. Equally, like, greater separation of concerns, right? The reducer is out of the view model, right? So anytime you're doing it.copy in your view model, that's not in the view model anymore. The view model just calls your use case, and it decides what the result is. It doesn't decide what the state is. And this state manipulation logic is actually where a lot of the complexity tends to come up, or at least where the hard testing comes. Uh, the second thing is state machine behavior. Third thing, state machine behavior. In theory, this is all theory, if you go on Crash Lytics, right, and you go, you see a crash, you look at the logs, and you see the current state is this, the last intent was this, 
you should be able to reproduce it. Like, that should be it. As long as you know the current state and the current intent, you can just write some code to send that intent in that state and see what happens. It doesn't always work like that, but this is the idea, right? We're coming to observability that it's really easy to reproduce your bugs. And like I said, it enforces consistency. MVVM plus molecule. Uh, what do I like? The reusability is really, really nice. I'm not going to lie. I, I think the slides didn't do it justice, but I would really recommend you to try using this in a project. It just feels so fun. Uh, great for combining and transforming reactive streams. Like, if you've ever used the combined method, like, you should just use Molecule. It's so much better. Everything is a flow, which you'll notice it's in the bad section too, but we'll get to that. But everything is a flow. And it all just works really nicely with Compose. Like, you have a composable, you have a presenter. It makes sense. And the last point is I put the code sparks joy. This is a Marie Kondo quote for anyone who's watched that show on Netflix. Uh, yeah, like, you just enjoy writing it. And I don't know if that's like a real benefit for an architecture, but I thought it was worth mentioning that it was fun. Like, what I don't like, we're coupling the view model directly with our UI framework, right? Like, I think everyone in this room is probably like a big Compose fan. Everyone loves Compose, we like it. But if you've been an Android developer long enough, you probably know that it's not a guarantee that we're going to be doing Compose forever. Google might change their mind. So you probably don't want to tie your entire architecture to some framework that you don't actually maintain. Uh, it's not actually a UI framework. It's only Compose runtime, but it's a differentiation that seems a little redundant to me. Uh, no dependency injection makes things a real pain. So you notice the presenter was a function. So I couldn't inject the use case via dagger. I had to pass the, view, the flow from the view model to the presenter. And when you have a complex screen, you're basically just doing dependency injection in your view model, and it feels really weird. So I don't really like that. I think it would make more sense if you could use Dagger as well. Everything is a flow. You can't call, you can't launch a coroutine from a composable, which probably has never caused you a problem in the past. But when your entire view model is a composable, it causes you a lot of pain when you really just want to call the suspend method and throw it away. And you can't. You have to turn it into a flow first. And also testing. Like, Molecule is very magical. And when you write magical code, your tests better be magical too. Otherwise, you're probably going to find some bugs. So which is the best, right? Like, What do I like? I'm going back to this quote. Good decisions need context. So I would say if you're working in a massive team with 50 developers and tons of code, and you really, really like if hot fixing or having bugs in production is like a massive issue for you and people are going to be stressed, there's a really good use case for MVI. Like it's hard to make an argument against it. I'm going to lie. I'm not going to lie. But if you're just like making a project on the weekend, or like if you work in a team with five people, I don't think you really need to do all the effort to get going with MVI when you can just have human conversations and do MVVM and trust that your teammates are going to write good code and you're going to review it. <coughs> I'm going to compare this to UFC. So again, anyone who knows me knows that I'm a really big UFC fan. So going back to UFC 1, you can see it on the poster here. But the idea of the original UFC was like, OK, we have all these martial arts, karate, kickboxing, jiu-jitsu. If you have a karate guy fight a jiu-jitsu guy, who wins, right? Like, which is better? Which should I go pay money to get a black belt in? Uh, turns out the answer 20 years later at UFC 300 is none of them. Uh, the best is. To take ideas from each and make your own style, which is competitive, right? Like you have Max Holloway, who's a boxer who throws kicks and knows jujitsu, versus Justin Gaethje, who went to high school for wrestler and now never wrestles and just boxes. And they fight each other and they figure out who's the best. And it doesn't really look like one martial art, it looks like MMA. So I made this comparison. I do Muay Thai, for anyone who doesn't know. I love Muay Thai. So in Muay Thai, you have a square stance. In karate, you have a bladed stance. In Muay Thai, you focus on being in close to your opponent at all times. In karate, you never want to be close to your opponent. You want to be very far away. Uh, in Muay Thai, you clinch. In karate, there's no clinching, et cetera. I'm not going to talk about martial arts much longer. <laughs> but like, the thing is, like, there's no reason you can't do Muay Thai with a bladed stance and win. Like, there's no reason you can't do Muay Thai and never clinch and win. Like, these are just implementation details of the principles of your martial art. So if we compare this to MVVM and MVI, right? Like MVVM and MVI, they both have observable states. 
MVVM, you have multiple inputs. MVI, you have single inputs. MVVM, you can have multiple states. MVI, you have a single state. In MVI, you separate the reduction logic, but there's no reason you can't do MVVM with one state, right? There's no reason you can't do MVVM with a base class. There's no reason you can't do MVVM with a reducer. These are all ideas. And I would say, like, my recommendation is try everything, figure out what you like, and then pick and make your own. I mean, don't make your own thing, right? Like, but don't reinvent the wheel. But there's a lot of types of wheels, and they don't all look the same. So figure out what wheel is for you is really the moral of the talk. Uh, I wanted to briefly touch on this blog post. I have no idea how I'm doing for time. But so there's this guy, his name, which is escaping me, so I'm hoping the notes are there. It's, it's not there. But he was really involved in the development of Lisp. I can't remember his name right now. But he really wrote this blog post complaining about what he called the MIT slash Stanford style of design. So he said, an architecture, there's really four things that you're optimizing for. Simplicity, it should be simple. Correctness, it should be correct in all observable aspects. Consistent, you could use the same approach for every feature, right? And completeness, your solution should cover every possible scenario. His argument is basically you cannot have all four of these things. Like, eventually, you're going to have to pick one over the other. But a lot of people, they try to optimize for all of them at the same time, and it just becomes a complete mess. So he sort of laid out this idea of it's more important for the implementation to be simple than the interface, but simplicity <coughs> is the most important consideration. It is slightly better to be simple than correct, but consistency can be sacrificed for simplicity in some cases, but it is better to drop these parts. And yeah, completeness, yeah. Completeness can be sacrificed in favor of any other qualities. In fact, completeness must be sacrificed whenever implementation simplicity is Jeopardized, that's a hard word. But how many of you have worked with an engineer, right, who like, they have this new shiny feature that their product manager brought to them, and they have this weird use case that to them doesn't look anything like anyone's ever built in your app before, and so they think, let's change the whole architecture for my feature. He's basically saying, don't do that, like, just have an exception for your one case that doesn't meet your architecture, it doesn't have to cover everything, right? And yeah, we're hiring at Trainline, here's the QR code again. <laughs> If you want to work on MVI, MVVM, MVP, we have all of them. So <laughs> if you want to work on interesting things, come high. <laughs>